if you look at like bonus content, right, you can then convert, you know, anywhere in the first year, you'll typically see about anywhere from three to 5% of your uh, listener base. And that's usually will average about, if you look at downloads per episode, three to 5% of that will convert if you're offering a compelling enough uh, bonus content structure within the first year. I'm your host, Jeff Umbro, and this is Podcast Perspectives, a show about the latest news in the podcast industry and the people behind it. Each episode, we bring you discussions about the latest news in the audio world and conversations with leaders in the industry. Joining me today is Eric Barnett, Director of Sales and Marketing at Supporting Cast. Supporting Cast is a company that offers premium subscription solutions for audio publishers. That could be in podcasts, audiobooks, or anything in between. The non-jargony way of saying that is that it is a tool that allows you to charge subscription fees for exclusive and premium access to your content. They have partnered with huge names in the audio industry, including NPR, Wondery Plus, Pushkin, American Public Media, Slate, Sony Music, and WNYC. Eric spent seven years prior to supporting cast at Findaway, an audiobooks distribution platform that was later acquired by Spotify and is helping to enable their push into the audiobook industry. The two themes that we discussed today are audiobooks in the podcast industry and premium subscription content on your podcasts. Hope you all enjoy the interview. So now that we know what you had for breakfast, Eric, how you doing? (laughs) I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm doing great. I love it. So I want to talk about two major things today. One is subscriptions. One's going to be audiobooks. You have a lot of experience in both. Um, So to start, what does supporting cast do so i'm an end user like what do i expect from the service sure absolutely so supporting cast essentially we're the largest independent podcast subscription platform and ultimately what we do as an organization is try to help companies to be able to or podcast to be able to sell premium podcast subscriptions to listeners um and that could be an ongoing subscription that could be a single time sale And then ultimately when that's done to get people from that purchase to listening to their content as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And ultimately like the biggest part in which we will do there is, you know, the full control and ownership is with the podcasters versus supporting cast. So we're completely white labeled in that sense. But think about it. Like if I had to describe it in like a sentence, like if somebody has like 10 seconds to understand it, we'd say white label Patreon and then people will generally understand what it is from there. And functionally, like, what does that look like? You guys have the software, you can process the credit cards, all that stuff, but um, do you provide like a, a website landing page? Is it just code that you give to somebody and then they implement it themselves? Like big picture, how, how, what would somebody need to understand in order to implement this? You don't need to understand much, but we have three primary ways in which people can sort of uh, integrate with supporting cast. Basically, you can use a supporting cast landing page, which we have I'd say the majority of the people that we integrate with will choose to go that route just because it is functionally the most simple to be able to do that. Um, you can also see name the URL as well. So it is, again, you don't, people wouldn't even know that they're coming to a supporting cast landing page. NPR would actually be a great example of somebody who's using that. You go to plus.npr.org. That's technically a supporting cast in the background that is powering that site and everything for them. So we do that. The second way in which people integrate with us, we do have a WordPress plugin that people can implement and utilize. So if they have a WordPress site, they can take and fully have the experience within their website to allow people to purchase and then ultimately consume the premium content or access to premium content from their site. Um, Pushkin and Dan Savage and Savage Love would be the best examples of people we have who are doing that great. And then the last one, which is sort of the more complex version of it, is that if you do have an existing subscription or something that you already have, and you're trying to integrate supporting cast into a part of it, you can do a full API integration in which we just basically will integrate with whatever your existing subscription is and will handle the delivery of the premium audio from there. So best examples of those would be Wondery and Wondery Plus. So, you know, they use us for an API integration, basically anything that's consumed outside of the Wondery Plus app that's supporting cast in the background that is delivering that audio to that person in whatever podcast app that they want. Or actually Slate, which is our parent company, slate.com, they also do a API integration with us where they're technically a news subscription first and foremost, and then the podcast subscription is a part of that, and then we deliver the premium audio for them as well. So you guys are mainly a vehicle to deliver the audio and like process the payments and subscriptions and 
primarily, yeah, but we do a lot of stuff outside of that. So that's just, I don't want to limit it to sort of that, but yeah, that is, that's what we specialize in and doing first. So audio first subscriptions and people who have additional stuff added to it, like that's, you know, we, we specialize. So now that we know what the platform is all about and everything, what are actual use cases for why people would want to use support and cast? I know that's a silly question, but <laughs> like just if yeah. for anybody who, who isn't aware, like why do people want to implement premium feeds? I mean, it's, yeah, if you, you take it back from like a higher level, right? Like there's, there's a question about why would you do a subscription to begin with, right? And ultimately in, in the world of podcasting, there's, there's two, maybe three, you can consider primary ways in which people can draw revenue. So ad revenue being the one that most people are familiar with. You have a certain number of downloads, therefore you have a certain number of impressions that'll be associated with, therefore we get paid this much money. You know, it's interesting because that's a little bit more volatile. What's different from this in advertising is that subscription revenue is wholly owned by the podcast or wholly owned by the organization, right? So there's the work that you put into it is something that you will see benefit from every single month. It's something that is much more predictable. It is something that allows you to build a sustainable base that only grows over time as well, too. That's the other really interesting part is that, you know, every subscriber that you get, people that join, you know, your revenue will only increase up and to the right over long term. So it just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow over the years. And even when it plateaus, that is something that will, you know, still be sustainable for you for long. And are you guys explicitly leaning into that right now? You know, because of the ad market dip that we're seeing on a macro level, uh, is this part of your pitch? You know, it's funny. It didn't, it doesn't have to be part of our pitch, right? It wasn't necessarily part of our pitch. Like owning revenue was always part of our pitch people's reason for coming to us is, you know, that's, you know, we hear that more often now for sure, but it is and to an extent, like sometimes like we'll, we, you know, we're talking for new partnerships. I would say the majority of our business comes from referrals right now. And that's just sort of what, and we're, we're okay with that, right? Like for us, it's something where like the quality of our work speaks for itself. We very much pride ourselves on being a white label solution where it's like, if you look at somebody initially, you may not know that they're partnering with supporting cast and that's okay because we want it to be Pushkin Plus first, right? It's their subscription first and foremost, and we're sort of an afterthought in that case. And we we haven't really gotten into like what specifically your role is yet. Uh, you are the director of sales and marketing, but what does that mean in this particular context? Yeah. So my job is essentially just to um, oversee new partnerships and then ultimately the promotion of the organization as well too. So we have a sales team internally that um, oversees a couple of different parts of um, sales verticals that we operate in. So we do uh, we operate in three primary sales verticals, and I oversee the teams for those. So that would be podcast memberships, internal podcasts, and direct audiobook sales. And all those four sort of fall under my umbrella in terms of partnership explorations within those realms, and then also the marketing and sort of promotional side of the business as well too. So anything that we do from paid advertisements, um, sponsorships, promotions, things like that as well too. As well. Can you give me a few examples of like uh, your ideal customer clientele? Sure. Yeah, it's. I don't want to say like we have an ideal one because like what we pride ourselves in again, I said, is sort of like the flexibility of the platform. You could be a single you know podcast and want to do a subscription, or you could be a complicated network, and either one of those we could cater to. But there are some that do well that we see do well on a regular basis with. Uh, subscriptions for what it's well. They they all can do very well. Um, some categories that overperform for some reason would be like history, since perform very very well from a subscription standpoint. So all the every almost every history podcast that we have, um, the rest is history out of England. Actually, probably the largest of those that it's like performs excellent from a subscription standpoint. So that is some that's just like an interesting tidbit. You know, if somebody has a history podcast out there that's considering that, um, sports also tend to do really well from a per capita subscriber basis and like for a show like Dunked On, uh, the NBA podcast is the one that is, in my opinion, the best performing podcast subscription in the world in terms of how well they wow. are actually able to perform. Um, High you know, praise. I, we could talk more details about that. Yeah. You know, and then you'll also see anything that is host driven as well too. So if you have a strong host that has a strong connection with their subscribers, they will often have a really strong subscription to go with that. Like we launched with uh, Nick Vial and the Vial Files earlier this year and excellent, excellent subscription, huge, like just a huge push right out of the gate. Like it was a very impressive launch from their, from their perspective as well. 
this is going to sound so silly, but I check the subscri- or the comments on that show, like the Apple reviews on the Vile Files, uh, because like every day there's like 20 new comments in there. And most of them are, are really like awful, like one star reviews saying like X, Y, and Z. But the fact that people care that much that like every single day you can go on there and hit refresh and you're going to have like 20 different <laughs> versions of, of that, like, you know, painful review. It says so much about that show because you know that there's 200 people who aren't commenting. But I, I guess my my question, the reason I bring that up is like uh, you kind of laid out a profile of like the types of shows that can like garner engagement uh and that is generally shows that can build community but is there like a scale at which it makes sense uh you know like can somebody with 100 subscribers however dedicated do this and do this well or do you need to hit like some kind of threshold you know that that's actually a really really good question and on on our side of things you know, we usually don't recommend people to start a subscription unless they're seeing at least five to 10,000 downloads per episode. Like that's when it will start to be some like meaningful revenue, at least to an extent for people with a show that size. You can do it smaller, but you just need to have like realistic expectations of what your return is going to be, right? So we have data from across all supporting cast partners of what your uh, average conversion rates would be. So, you know, like for instance, like if you offer ad free and that's going to be the only sort of benefit that you offer, you can realistically expect anywhere from a half a percent to 1% of your subscribers to convert within the first year up to maybe 2% over the course of three years. So like, again, if that's a hundred people, that's, you know, yeah, you're looking at like one or two people. Right. So it's not going to be really worth it for you. It's going to be like five bucks a month. Yeah. But you know, and then, you know, if you look at like bonus content, right, you can then convert, you know, anywhere in the first year, you'll typically see about anywhere from three to 5% of your uh, listener base. And that's usually will average about, if you look at downloads per episode, three to 5% of that will convert if you're offering a compelling enough uh, bonus content structure within the first year. That will usually go up to around 8% over the course of like three years or so. And you know, and if you are a large enough show, that is some very meaningful revenue for people to have and something that is you know very consistent and easy for them to track. Interestingly enough, if you look at like when we're talking about some of these niche shows as well, too, there is a world in which you can paywall the majority of your content. If we're talking about Dunk Down, I think that it's, it's a good example to come back to, right? So they, um, you know, Nathan Duncan and Dunk Down, there was a five day a week daily podcast that was free. And all five days were free. And when they partnered with us, um, you know, they made the decision like, okay, we're going to paywall the majority of this content. And they paywall four of their five days. So Monday through Thursday, is subscriber only and Friday is their free show that's available to everybody. And, you know, they converted in their case, like 25, 30% of their audience converted over to a paid subscriber and for a mid-sized show of roughly like 20, 30 style downloads per episode. Like that's a lot of money. And, and that's like a lot of money that is, you know, curable that they can track. And so there is a world in which you can make way more money from subscriptions than you can from advertising just because of how dedicated your audience is. In one part we should be clear about as well too, there is also like distinct strategy differences from individual shows versus networks as well too. So those are two different sort of approaches to this. Um, you know, in networks, for what it's worth, they'll see the same types of conversion numbers that individual shows will see, but it's typically a little bit of a slower burn. Whereas like individual shows will come and like oh, shoot right up almost immediately. Networks will sort of like come out and have like a little bit more of a gradual start and then have a higher ceiling probably really tough unless there's like uh, content alignment within the network which is not always the case right but are you what kind of strategies are people using to actually convert because i'm sure that there's a whole range of like you know how people are actually implementing this yeah so we have you know best practices and stuff that we typically recommend i mean first and foremost is you have to make sure your offer is compelling right that's the other thing like if you come in and like oh we just want to do a subscription because we heard it's like you know the the sort of soup du jour, the thing to do right now is subscriptions. You're, you're not going to convert anybody. You're just not. And like the like, you have to have a compelling offer. If you are a weekly podcast and you want to give something that is actually worth it to people, you should consider doing at least one to two bonus episodes per month, possibly even more than that, where you have bonus episodes, you could have uh, Q&A sessions, you get all these different things that are there, but you can then charge accordingly for the content that you're providing people, right? Like, if you look at from like a pricing perspective, five bucks being the average part for a subscription, you look at what you're doing and you can sort of adjust up or down from there based upon what you're doing relative to the rest of the market. So once you have a compelling offer, 
in place, it's all about, you know, the first thing to do is making sure that you are pitching this and you're pitching this with, um, you know, passionately and on a consistent basis, right? Like it's no different than anything else. Like, you know, welcome to the show. We really appreciate having you here. If you want to continue to support us, please join our new new subscription program, XYZ Prime. You know, you can go to this website in order to do it. We'd really appreciate your support, blah, blah, blah. And then you sort of move on. You do that one or two times per show. And that's like your biggest driver. And then from there, you know, it's making sure that people can find your subscription simply. So you have a simple URL or you have something that's easy for people to remember. You have a link in the show notes. You have a link in the episode notes. Um, all of those elements that people can find. Um, and then interesting enough, the one that most people will forget is also putting free previews of your bonus content, right? So if you are doing bonus content and something that's really good, like extended interviews or something like that, put the first five minutes of the interview for free on your free feed and then sort of fade it out and say like, hey, if you want to continue listening to this, make sure you become XYZ Prime member, blah, 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 by going to this website. We'd love to have you there. And those, those are sort of like your best practices that will get you those conversion numbers that you're looking for. Yeah, we did a premium subscription model with Apple on one of our shows and uh, we took the, I, I mean, admittedly, we took kind of the easy route and just offered like ad free and, and we did have bonus content and extended interviews, but we didn't do a ton of promotion for this. Like we did a dynamically inserted ad in the show and just kind of said like, if you're interested in more, check it out. And it was kind of shocking to me, A, how, how few subscribers we got on the premium feed. It was closer to the 1%, I think. But also on the flip side, like it was shocking how many subscribers we got based on how little we did. It it strikes me that we probably could have uh, gone a little bit further. And we were just with the Apple ecosystem, uh, which brings me to my next question. Who are some of your competitors out there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the most well-known, like you, you hit on one just a second ago. So, I mean, Apple has their own sort of native subscription platform that they've built into that. Um, the most notable of which would be Patreon is probably the one that I think we get compared to most often. And then occasionally stuff with like Substack or I think that, that would get brought in as well. And what are the offers that you guys have that would bring people to supporting cast as opposed to uh, like a Patreon or an Apple like premium? So, I mean, for us, the biggest reason that people will choose supporting cast over our partners or over our competitors really is it's all about ownership and whose subscription it is first and foremost, right? Like, you know, NPR is, is never going to sell a Patreon, right? They're just not, like, it's just not within their brand. It's something that doesn't finish. And so if you want to have your subscription be your subscription first and foremost, that's when you come to supporting cast. You know, and our biggest thing is that at the end of the day, these are your subscribers. You own the relationship with them. You own the data. Even if you don't work with supporting cast in the future, your paying subscribers go with you, right? And that is something that really any of our competitors aren't able to say, or at least say with any real degree of, uh, of truth behind it. And that's something where like we pride ourselves very much on that, right? And ultimately you are giving access to everyone. You're allowing people to consume in whichever podcast app that they want. We are host agnostic, so you can be with whatever podcast host that you want. You can set up integrations with whatever CRM that you want. Um, so it's ultimately like our goal is to make it as one, as easy as possible for people to own their subscription and have it and set it up and continue to do it. And then two, give them full control of ownership over it in the long run as well too. And that's the, why we believe it really is the compelling offer. And it's why we work with the people that we do, you know, eight of the top 25 podcast networks, trust us, hundreds of top shows uh, around the world, trust us. And they do that very much for a reason, right? It's because of who we are as an organization, our mission behind it, and like what we're always trying to do. I couldn't agree more. I think that um, there are a lot of kind of options in this space and a lot of them are, are really, really great and offer really compelling, you know, value props. But you guys are the ones that kind of check all of the boxes and then also deliver on it. So are you nervous about any of your existing competitors or anything in the space? Like, do you feel that there is enough of an ecosystem here for multiple people to be successful here? Yes, I do think there's enough of an ecosystem for multiple people to be successful for sure. Um, you know, it's the world of podcasting. Like it's, you can sort of say like, you know, high tide rises all ships. Like as the industry grows, you know, the ability to be able to grow premium subscriptions, whether they be through supporting cast or otherwise, will continue to be there. So yeah, I definitely think there's more than enough, um, you know, market share for sort of everybody to be part of it. Of course, I would love supporting cast to be the biggest part of that. That's just my goal and my, you know, in general here as, as my role. But um, 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you're you're making great strides in that direction. So uh, I want to shift our focus a tiny bit now to audiobooks. And I was hoping that you could give us a little bit of background as to like your role in the audiobook industry. And then uh, we'll move that forward to like what you're doing today with audiobooks. Yeah. So historically, you know, prior to my to my life at supporting guests with, with Findaway, which was the largest audiobook, digital audiobook distributor in the world based out of Cleveland as well, too. And then I left Findaway, that would have been almost a, a little over a year and a half ago to some supporting guests. And that was sort of right as the acquisition to Spotify completed. So I was there through to, sort of through the acquisition of that. Um, and then my role at Findaway was similar in capacity to sort of what I'm doing with supporting cast. It was, it was business development. So less sort of sales and overseeing the sales team and more just sort of straight business development and partnerships specifically. So any type of corporate partnership in there, uh, help facilitate that primarily on the side of new retailers who are looking to sell audiobooks. Can you give me in, in 60 or 90 seconds, like kind of a lay of the land of the audiobook industry today as a consumer? And then, uh, if it's relevant as like you know, somebody who is a distributor of audiobooks. So the audiobook world is, I mean, it used to be divided into physical audiobooks and digital audiobooks with, you know, and obviously books on CD and books on tape are no longer a thing. There's still technically a device that's called a playaway that is, that's being sold um, by formerly a find away that's libraries, but you know, that's a smaller share of it. So when we speak audiobooks, we're primarily talking about digital audiobooks these days and when you look at it, so we'll start with sort of a retail perspective, right? So when you look at the retail world of audiobooks, there's a lot of biz- different business models. There's a couple of distributors, but, you know, ultimately you have Audible sort of being the, you know, like the elephant in the room of the largest uh, subscriber, largest audiobook platform. But that market share is decreasing, um, you know, and they run primarily on a credit subscription business. So you pay, you know, 15 bucks per month, you get one audiobook credit to consume with however you want. You know, I have my thoughts about that business model. I think for better, for worse, like it is, is, I think it's holding back the industry in a lot of ways, but, um, you know, you have that. And then outside of that, you have a bunch of sort of secondary retail platforms that are also really big. Apple books being the second largest in the, in the marketplace, followed by, uh, Barnes and Noble and Nook audiobooks also continues to be quite successful. Audiobooks.com, I guess, carrying a decent amount of market share, Libro FM. So there's all of these ones that are doing sort of a la carte sales, um, that are fairly successful at it. The difficult part I'll say about a la carte sales is that it's very much like a discount uh, type of game when you're going into it, right? Like, so people don't really know how much an audiobook actually costs because they're so used to paying. They understand that a credit costs 15 bucks. So they think all audiobooks cost 15 bucks. But the actual digital list price of that is anywhere from about like $8 up to like $45 or $50, depending on the length of the audiobook and on all this different back around it. So there can be sort of some sticker shock that exists when somebody wants like, you know, 45 bucks for the new Matthew McConaughey audio, something like that. And then there's a whole group of people that also will do um, subscriptions and like all you can consume models. Uh, Script probably being the most successful of those. The difficult part about those is that publishers are not as on board as say music labels are or things like that uh, when it comes to those types of revenue models. So they can be difficult for a retailer to sustain because it can be very expensive for them very quickly in order to have that type of subscription or the catalog will be so limited that it's not compelling to a consumer because it's a bunch of older titles, right? So it's there. I think it'll get bigger. I'm very curious to see what Spotify is going to be rolling out here in the next year or so. Um, I know they're going to be making some big moves. I think it'll be good for the industry as a whole, to tell you the truth. And if I could plug supporting Cass on this real quick yeah. too, we also do direct audio sales, right? So that same technology that will deliver premium podcast subscriptions, you can do that with direct audiobook sales as well. So best example would be like Malcolm Gladwell and Pushkin and his publishing arm. We do all of their direct audiobook sales. Um, we have actually probably by the time this comes out, it might be it might be public, but we have a very big partnership with one of the big five publishers that's coming out here within the next couple of months. So we're super excited. Congrats. That was actually going to be my next question for you is uh, what kind of like novel, uh, pun intended, like ideas are you seeing with book publishers or otherwise starting to use RSS technology for audiobooks? Uh, I will say it's something um, I can't speak a ton to it, right? Because we're we're under India, but I'll say we have a lot of really active talks that are currently going on for book publishers in terms of what we're doing in this space. Direct audiobook sales is one I'm most bullish about in terms of 
publishers that can take advantage of the podcast ecosystem. Because if you look at the way that the audiobook market is set up, it is a, they're all walled gardens, right? Like every single one of them is like, it's controlled by the retailer. The publishers or the authors have no control over anything. And the retailer, surprise retailer does all these different things. Um, and then ultimately the retailer owns all the data versus like direct sales where you can take advantage of what an RSS feed does and deliver it to an ecosystem where people are already used to consuming audio. But in this case, you control it. You make more money from this, like, you know, your royalty rates are typically about like 45% for what you're looking at when you're selling an audiobook through the normal channels versus like 86, 87% of what you keep when you sell it direct to people. So, I mean, it is, it's a order of magnitude different in terms yeah. of how successful you can be for the money that you're keeping for your content. It was like the revolution that happened with eBooks back in the day and self-publishing. Historically, you needed like bookstores and distributors and sales and publicity and everything in order to get your book in front of readers. And today, you know, you have like the Colleen Hoovers who started off as, you know, self-published authors and threw it on Amazon's like Kindle Direct or whatever it was. And, you know, now she's the number one selling author in, in the world. With social media, uh, with the lack of gatekeepers, you know, out there in, in the podcast space and everything, like you can, in theory, like be really successful on your own there. Yeah, you really can. And you're much closer to the market. Like, it's interesting. So I, I actually, outside of supporting cast and you know, find a way world and stuff like that, I sit on the board for the Audio Publishers Association. Oh, so nice. that's like a collection of all the world's largest um, traditional audio publishers are the ones that are mostly a part of it. But, you know, we're making a big push as an organization. Like, they're, the world of podcasting and audiobooks is slowly colliding, right? They're, what's cool about it, I'll say from my, like, macro perspective of being in both is that they almost have, like, opposite problems. And I think they could benefit from each other in a lot of ways, right? Like in podcasting, it's so people are so used to having free content and that there's a, you know, no matter what people aren't necessarily willing to pay for it, in my opinion, unless they're successful and they have a really good subscription. But I will say that there's still <laughs> the, the expectation that it's free. Outside of that audiobooks, there is the expectation that they sometimes are too prohibitively expensive, right? But the benefit of that is that there's no listen in an audiobook that isn't monetized. It doesn't matter if it's an all-you-can-eat consumption or a la carte, it's always monetized. And the difference between the two is very interesting is that podcasts have a much higher ceiling in terms of the amount of money that they can earn with a collection of, you know, advertising and subscription together. But the floor is also way lower. Like, you know, you could be really in the red, maybe losing all sorts of money for even any type of podcast size. And then on a audiobook, you don't need to sell a ton of units in order to break even. So you may not make a bunch of money, but um, you know, you aren't going to necessarily be in the red. And But the difference is the ceiling is lower for an audiobook, but they have a higher floor. Podcasting's much higher ceiling, much lower floor. Can you explain to the listener like what's going on with Spotify uh, and why they're not able to have like a seamless sales operation within the app for audiobooks? Actually, anybody in the app market will run into this issue and that's just a structural monopoly that both um, Apple and Google to an extent have was in the app market, right? Like if you're using in an in-app payment system, you are going to have to pay Apple or Google 30% in order to make that transaction within an app. When you're looking at the world of like any type of subscription, whether that be audiobooks, whether that be a subscription to a game, it doesn't really matter cutting 30% off the top of it will sometimes make that model unsustainable, right? Like it just won't be possible. Like retailers typically want like at least 30 to 50% of margin to play with so they can make a profit on whatever product they're selling, right? Like if a book is a price for 20 bucks, they expect to buy that book for 10 bucks at wholesale. So therefore they can make money in order to sustain their store. Now, if you come in and, you know, you say that this same book is, 20 bucks, but Apple is going to take, you know, another $4 out of $5, like all of a sudden it becomes crazy in terms of like the little money that you're trying to eke out from this, let alone all of your competitors are selling at a discount, Apple selling at a discount, Google selling it at a discount at their own store. So that's what's going to plague Spotify. I think they're even trying to go to court over this right now. Fortnite did the same thing with Apple in terms of like trying to take them like you're killing the business by taking this much money. I, I also, I mean, I get Apple's perspective, but it's it's interesting. I, I'm very curious to see where this goes long term. Uh, yeah, I've been paying close attention here, and, and it makes sense. Like when we're selling ads, it generally will cost us, you know, like 20 percent of the sale uh, goes to like the overhead of actually going about selling. Uh, 
super rough numbers. And thus we usually have a 30, 70 split or like a 40, 60 split, depending on the show and what they need from us. Um, but whenever somebody comes to us and asks for like an 80, 20, like I explained to them, you know, it costs us 20% to actually do this work. So we already right. have pretty thin margins on this and, and we can't really budge on that. And so just imagine somebody coming in and pulling 30% right off the top before you even get to the part where you have to like, think about a profit kind of wild and and to your point like i also see where apple's coming from like they make this whole thing possible but on the same note like this is not a sustainable thing long term no it's not yeah i don't i don't think the general public like if you're not savvy to the tech business right and sort of like the the models and everything that's in there like people just want stuff cheaper they don't really care about the back end but it's like they don't realize that everyone thinks all these tech companies are super successful but they're like maintaining on these razor thin margin that if something goes wrong, like, you know, the whole thing sort of falls apart. I, I also wanted to talk to you about what your thoughts are uh, about the idea that Spotify and some other players may try and monetize audiobooks through advertising. Uh, what do you think that does to the product, to the listener, to the author? Um, are you for or against? Oh, I'm, abs I'm absolutely for it. hundred percent for it. I pushed for that quite hard at find a way where we explored a model pretty deeply about potentially doing something, you know, ad supported audiobooks, And it, you know, it's not everybody is ready for that, right? There is, if you look at, if we make the comparison again, between podcasting and audiobooks, where it's like podcasts, I define that typically as a very personality driven business where it's like people that are there, the ones that are making the shows and like, you know, they're, they're all for advertising because that's the health of it. But it's like audiobooks there it's a content driven business and that's that is a good thing to an extent but there is sort of this like air of probably superiority is probably the wrong word but it's like you know it's sort of something like that where there is like the sanctity of the content and like the like how precious it is and it's a good and it, it's cool that you love your content that much but i think that can often be to the detriment of the publishers or the industry as a whole because they're holding back new business models and the overall growth of the organization by trying to maintain these things, uh, you know, traditional a la carte sales and blah, 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 versus like, hey, put something out there with some ads and get people listening to it. Like when we're talking about that high ceiling, like people don't realize how much money they can make by combining, you know, all this advertising revenue in addition to their direct sales. Like you could do that. Like you could do the same thing in terms of like, you know, you have a free version of the audiobook that's available that's ad supported. You have a premium version of the audiobook that needs to be purchased and the premium version comes with additional content and everything too like there's so many cool things you could do if people were willing to get out of their way and try something innovative so for anybody who's interested in checking out supporting cast and looking at premium subscriptions or uh launching an audiobook direct to consumer uh you can check out supportingcast.fm eric where can someone find you if they're interested in learning more yeah, specifically, if you're looking for me, you can do eric, E-R-I-C dot Barnett, B-A-R-N-E-T-T, -T, at supportingcast.fm. Um, you can also just reach out to hello at supportingcast.fm, and that will eventually get to me as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I appreciate it, Jeff. It's always great to, to talk shop with you, man. Thanks again to Eric for joining us. You can find him at eric.barnett at supportingcast.fm. If you have any interest in diving into the audiobook or the premium subscription industry and learning more about your own podcast solutions. Have questions, tips, or podcast recommendations? You can follow me on all of the socials at Jeff Umbro. Podcast Perspectives is a production of The Podglomerate. If you're looking for help producing, distributing, or monetizing your podcast, you can find us at podglomerate.com. Shoot us an email at listen at thepodglomerate.com or follow us on all social platforms at Podglomerate. Thank you to Chris Boniello, Henry Lavoy, and Jordan Aaron for producing this show. Thank you for listening, and I will catch you next week.